Hey everyone, it's Federico here and this is the second video of the Make Stuff Look Good in Max Jitter series. Sorry for the interruption, this is uh, editing of Federico and somehow I realized that I managed to mess up the intro to my video. So what I wanted to tell you is that the things that I've been telling you in the previous video and what I will tell you in this one possibly in the next videos as well, comes from this article which has been recently published on the new documentation website from Cycling74. Before it was not online, that's why I didn't share it with you, but now it's online. So uh, there is this new website, docscycling74.com, and if we go into learn, click on learn here, here you can find the old JIT tutorials, the old Max tutorials and so on, but there is also kind of featured series. And the Polish Your Pixel article is an article from Matteo Marsen. This is the source of the knowledge for uh, this series of videos that I'm doing. So now we'll pass it back to Federico from the past, which will tell you more about this. What I told you about uh, in the previous video was mostly from the color science demystified and light rendering. There is an anti-aliasing part, which we didn't cover, uh, which you can definitely check for yourself. And now the light rendering part is, is such a good article. And it goes really into depth on how the algorithm works. So I didn't cover that part in my previous video. I'm not going to cover it in this video. Um, how actually the algorithm works. This is all written here by Mattel. Um, this is very well explained and very detailed. So for example, it covers the rendering equation, how this works, how this is implemented in Max, and then the ambient occlusion. And now actually the part that I would like to tell you in this video about is the shadows part. So we're going to skip ahead a bit. Image-based lightning is basically what we did with our environment and the skybox and the PBR objects. But now we're going to check the shadows portion of this article, which really helps in increase our sense of three-dimensionality and realism of the scene. So the scene is the same that we built in the previous video. I just put all the 3D objects inside this sub patcher called scene. Again, with the inverted zoom, I, I'm really struggling with that. Okay, so let's jump right into it and see how we can uh, improve the quality of our shadows in the scene. Now, first of all, to activate the shadows, what we did, let me go actually full screen on that. What we did in the previous video was to set the shadows um, attribute to one. By default, is set on zero. So if we set it on zero, you see that we don't have any shadows. But if we set it on one, you will see that the shadows appear. And uh, only objects that are connected to a GGL material or a GGL PBR will generate shadows. So for example, if I create a GGL grid shape here and give it like position, uh, maybe two, one, zero, something like that. You can see that it doesn't generate any shadows, but if I connect the GGL PBR to it, then it will start generating shadows. So we always need a PBR or um, GGL material. Cool. So let's see the parameters, the shadow parameters that we can influence directly from the GGL light. Uh, now, first of all, only um, a directional light and a spotlight generate shadows. So a point, a point light will not generate shadows. So you know that we have the types of shadows can be either directional, point, spot, or hemisphere. And only directional spot will generate light uh, shadows, right? So this is a directional light, which means a light that uh, basically is infinitely far, so it doesn't really have a position, all it has a direction, and all the rays hit our scene at the same angle. Not like a spotlight or a point light, where the rays hit our scene uh, from each ray from a different angle, basically. Right, so let's see which are the attributes that we can check for, uh, that we can set for our shadows from the light, and these are shadow quality, shadow blur, and shadow range. So first of all, let's see what the shadow blur does. Uh, let's try to increase it and you can see that uh, basically the shadows get bigger or smaller. Basically they get more blurred and less precise around the objects. Now a light that is infinitely far or is very far, like a directional light from the sun, doesn't really create these soft shadows. It only has hard shadows because if a light is very far, it doesn't create this transition zone between hard shadows and soft shadows. It 
only has hard shadows. While a light that is very close to, to the objects, for example, this would create this um, zone called penumbra, where the light kind of mingles with the shadows and create these shadows that is not so dark. So we have penumbra, which is basically the soft shadows, and then we have the umbra, which are the hard shadows. This is again very much well explained in the article. So with the shadow blur, we can basically set how much of these uh, soft shadows we get and how much of the hard shadows we get. And it somehow doesn't really come out from my scene so well, but you can see it very well defined in the article. So this will be the, the penumbra and that will be like a hard shadow. So that will be the soft shadow and that will be the hard shadow and this will be kind of in between. So for our scene where the light comes very far away, we, we want to have basically zero, zero shadow blur. So we can hard code that in our object. So shadow blur zero, right? And this looks now better because the shadows are more defined. Now let's see the other two attributes that we can change from GGL light, shadow range and shadow quality. Now um, in Max, the algorithm used to create the shadows is called shadow mapping. So to show you how shadow mapping works, there is a um, patcher inside Max. So if we open the, the search browser, this patcher is called lights.shadowmap texture, right? And here is the patcher. So basically, this will show you uh, what the light is seeing from uh, the light perspective. So let's actually copy these to uh, the substitute and these... Uh, get shadow text out name messages. Let's close this here. Let's pass them here and let's send this to the GGL light and let's send it at every frame. So let's connect it to the bang that comes out from uh, the JIT world and connect it to the substitute so we can see what's coming out as a texture. And there we go. So this is the basically the scene seen from the perspective of the light. So this is what the light is seeing. So the shadow mapping works by taking the distance from each point of the 3D objects that the light is seeing and then comparing this distance with the distance of uh, each point, not only that the light is seeing, but each point in the scene from the light. So if the light is first seeing, for example, let's say the dark head, the, the distance between the dark head and the light will be smaller than the distance between the floor and the light. And so if we see that the distance is smaller, it means that this point must be in shadow. I'm pretty much sure that this is a bad explanation, so you can check it out again in the article. But uh, once we know how this works, we know what the shadow range does. So the shadow range basically defines how much of the scene the light is capturing. So once we make this number bigger, you can see that we are capturing a bigger portion of the scene, but when the scene like is really far, you can see that the light starts to become uh, pixelated, uh, the shadows start to become pixelated because the resolution of the shadow map is simply too low. So we need to just to get to a part where we see the whole scene so, for example, something like that. Actually, my light could be uh, rotated a bit better. So, let me actually change the direction in order to have our scene completely inside our light view. But still, the light should come from our fake sun there. So, let me actually change the rotate x, x, y attribute for that and this looks good the light the, the sun is really low so the shadows should be pretty long just is not the correct angle right the light is not coming from that angle so something like that okay i think this is it so i'm going to go here transform change attribute to arguments and that's it so again uh, we can change the shadow range until we have all our scene inside the inside this texture, inside this image, and the shadow quality represents how big is going to be this texture. So if we make it low, you can see that the shadows are again pixelated because this texture is just going to be smaller. Uh, in fact, if we just get the GGL texture here and connect it here, we can check what the dimensions of these uh, textures are. So let's check with... Uh, high you can see that this is a square of 4096 pixel and if we go mid high is the alpha bit and then the alpha gain and so on uh, mid low is actually the same as mid 
it looks like. And low, it's like the half of that. So what we should do is to always start from high. And then if we see that uh, we get performance problems or, or we want to save some performance power, we can start to go down until our shadows start to become pixelated. So that's uh, how we can choose uh, the shadow quality attribute. Cool. Uh, let me just once again change the attributes to arguments just to be sure. Uh, I don't like really the position of these spheres, so I'm going to move it here, right there. Maybe I just put it in contact with the floor. Okay. And so this was the sphere. Where's the sphere? I think this is it. Change the attribute to arguments for that as well. Um, another thing that is in the article and I didn't really do uh, in the previous video is that it suggests not to use wall numbers for the colors. So let's say that we want this sphere to be red. It should not be like all the way one for the red, but should be like something like 0 0.8, 0 0.2 and 3 or something and 0 0.1. And that's because this color um, doesn't represent only a color when we use PBR, but it actually represents how much of the light is going to be reflected for that uh, color wavelength. So it's very rare in nature that we have an object that will reflect all the light uh, of a specific wavelength. Some of it is going to be absorbed anyway, even if we have a perfectly red, I mean, even if we have a very red object, this is not going to perfectly reflect all the red light. So we should always not set it to like these wall numbers because this is again physically based rendering. So we should take into account all these little physical nuances. So for example, if we want a green object again, we should just add a bit of green, a bit of blue, because we never have like a perfectly green object in real life. So it starts to look a bit more pastel maybe, but in a way this is more correct. So um, that's again our red panel. We just make it, uh, I don't know, I'm just putting sort of really kind of random numbers here. I just want to show you how these can look a bit better. Uh, the floor, okay, it's already like, it's already okay. Um, yeah, something like that. Okay, let's leave it at that. And let's go actually back talking about shadows. So we saw that we have these still these three attributes for shadows that we can set from the shadow from the GGL light. And I'm not going to trigger this texture each frame because this would be useless. But if you want to, uh, this, you actually just need to trigger it once you change the light direction or position in case it's a spotlight. So these are the three attributes that we can change from GGL light. But we can also modify um, other attributes directly from the GGL material or GGL PBR objects. So if we go in our scene sub patcher and we need to modify them from the objects that is receiving the shadows. So in this case, our floor. So these attributes are also three and these are shadow soft, uh, shadow radius, shadow hard and shadow epsilon. Now, um, shadow soft, let's say that we don't set the shadow blue to zero, but we set it to something like one. The shadow soft basically means how much of this is going to be soft shadow. And I think now you can really see the, what the shadow blur is doing, right? Because if we set it to zero, then it doesn't really do anything. But if we set it to one, we can see, we can modify the, the shadow softness from directly from the object itself. And the shadow are the, represents which the portion of the shadow, which is the, the hard shadow, so the umbra. We can set it to zero and only, for example, only have soft shadows, I guess. But I think you always want to mix a bit of hard shadows and soft shadows, in case this would be a light that was close to the scene. And then we can also use shadow radius to basically set the radius of those shadows, so we can make them bigger or smaller, I guess. And then we got the shadow epsilon. Now the, the shadow epsilon, so let's go actually back to our shadow blur zero here, so I can show you what the shadow epsilon does. Let's get the shadow soft to zero and shadow hard to one. This is basically what we want when we have a directional light that is very far like the sun in this case. 
Now the Shadow Epsilon is used to solve a problem which is called Shadow Acne, which is this one. If we set this to zero, you can see that we get these shadowy blue spots on the floor, although this is not a shadow, right? This portion of the floor. And that's because we say the shadow mapping works by getting the distance from each point that the light see to the light itself and then comparing it with the distance from each point in the scene to the light itself. And if there is nothing between these two points, so if this is actually the same distance, there could be some rounding errors in uh, the float numbers that our computer crunches. So this appears like the computer decides that this is in shadow, although this is not in shadow. So in order to fix that, we add a little offset to the shadow in order to avoid this problem. Once we do that, you can see that the shadow acne disappears. We just need to set it so high that we don't have this artifact anymore, but don't really need to push it. So I'm going to set it to 0.1 and that's it. We can also rotate the light to simulate uh, like the passing of time or something like that. Oh, at a certain point, you see that I, st I start to lose. We start to lose the um, a piece of the shadow texture here, so we should increase the shadow range in that case, I guess, until we start to lose resolution. Right, and then we should also change the color of the light in order to go from this reddish, which represents the, the sunset light, to something more whitish, I think. I could even multiply by something bigger, in order to give it like a more um, middle of the day feeling. Well, that's a bit too much. So, yeah, the shadows really help us with that, uh, to get a sense of uh, being in the scene and being in this environment. Cool. So, that was it. Uh, we managed. If you want a lot more details and uh, in-depth explanation of what I just showed you, uh, you can check this article. I will, of course, put a link in the description. And uh, as always, you can get this patch from my Patreon if you are a supporter. Thank you very much to all my supporters. This video will not be possible without you guys. So check out the Patreon to get the patch, support the channel and get access to hundreds of other patches that I've shared in the past. In the next video, we're going to check out to introduce global illumination, which is also something explained in the article. Thanks again to Matteo for writing it. It's really illuminating, I will say. And uh, I hope this was fun. So take care, stay sharp, and uh, see you next time. Ciao.